Hi, I'm Rabia Hanif Meo. I'm a country reporter at World Architecture Community from Pakistan. This interview is part of World Architecture Community's exclusive online interview series with eminent architects and designers. Today, we are going to converse with architect Yasmin Lari, who is the first female architect of Pakistan. She is renowned for her contribution in the convergence of architecture and social justice. Since her official retirement from architectural practice in 2000, her UN-recognized NGO, Heritage Foundation Pakistan, has been taking on humanitarian relief work and historical conservation projects in rural villages all around Pakistan. We at WAC would like to welcome architect Yasmin Lari. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. That's very kind. Uh, my first question to you is, the profession of architecture still fights the dominance of male architects in the industry. But if we look back, could you please tell us what were the challenges and difficulties that you faced as being the first female architect of Pakistan when you started your profession? Okay, well, of course, it was a long time ago, but I have to tell you that from the latest figures I've got from Pakistan Council of Architects and Town Planners, there are 35% women in the profession today, which is not bad, I would say. And uh, I'm told also that uh, uh, in most uh, cases in universities, uh, it's really women are, are now in majority, uh, the ones that are studying. So there's going to be lots of young women architects very soon. There still are, I think, many more than in my time. But I'm very happy to see that there are more and more are, you know, are joining the profession. So um, as I keep on telling, uh, um, <laughs> I don't think I had that much of a problem. Uh, I think um, there were very few of us, very few professional women anywhere around. And I think at that time, somehow people were a little bit diffident. They didn't know how to really tackle us. Uh, and also, I think the fact that you came from a family that might be well known or everybody knew everybody. So I think we got a lot of uh, protection from a lot of people. And I think most importantly, since my family from my parents and then my husband and his family everybody was very supportive of my working and that was quite remarkable because this is of course not something that happens all the time and that I think is what's important because uh, we have to make sure that everybody supports women women working outside their home and only then they're able to deliver now having said that I also know that I think younger women and now I think women have much more of a problem in dealing with things because there are so many more of you and uh, uh, I think men probably feel a little bit more threatened because I only got problems when I started to fight for any causes. Because as you know, I, I fought for getting the Pakistan Council of, uh, of uh, Architects and Town Planners uh, uh, ordinance, and I also fought for heritage. So those are, those are very tricky topics. So I think I only faced difficulties when I started to uh, really you know, work for a cause and maybe because I was a woman, so people felt that they probably could uh, uh, browbeat me and they could not. And uh, um, uh, so, you know, I think that was fine. And I guess when you take up any challenges, then you have to face the difficulties. So I did. And uh, but I think by and large, I had uh, a lot of uh, uh, support from a lot of people. And um, that's how I managed to carry on with the work. So, yeah, it was good. Okay, ma'am, how do you evaluate the role of today's female architects when you look at today's requirements of the profession? Is it still a problem? I think as all, uh, uh, as, as more and more women now are appearing on the scene and they are having to work away from home, I think there are lots of difficulties. I think a lot of women face uh, um, uh, not a very uh, supportive attitude from maybe their in-laws. Uh, I think a lot of women um, feel that maybe in the workplace they are not given the respect that they really ought to be given because the mindset is uh, still very traditional and very much into the medieval ages. Um, I mean, when we look at women generally around, and since I work a lot in the humanitarian field and I come in contact with a lot of poor women, I know that they have a lot of difficulties. Whatever they do, it's never taken seriously. Whatever they earn is not enough. I mean, whatever they, first of all, whatever they do, they don't get any money for that. And even when they are paid, then it's, they're not taken seriously. So I think a lot of times, oh, sorry, can we stop? It's, young women have more of a problem today than perhaps my generation did. 
And uh, but I think women also have to now stand steadfast. I think they should pursue their dream. I think they should do what they feel is the best thing. And uh, I think as long as you follow your principles and as long as you have a passion for what you do, then I think they're always uh, God probably in some way helps you out. This is what my experience has been. And uh, you are able to do the things that you want to do, but you, you really need to have the strength to be able to face any kind of difficulties and there will be difficulties. Okay, uh, do you, you've always uh, been working uh, and you've always been entrusted in heritage and activism to serve people's basic needs. And you founded the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan in 1980 with your husband. What motivated you to form the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan? Okay, now this again has a very long answer. See, I went to study in England. Uh, I went to Oxford School of Architecture. I graduated from there, which is now Oxford Brookes University. And um, uh, I think we were taught a lot of very good things. But one of the things we were taught was that we should really, like everybody had to become a prima donna architect, that you had to really be pursuing your own dream of the design. And that was above everything else that you might think or do. And... Um, and also there was a, uh, I'd been, I'd led a very kind of secluded life uh, in the civil lines because my my father was a was an, in a civil servant uh, before partition after after independence, he still continued in the same way. The, uh, the Sahab log were always given a lot of importance. And so as children, we were really kind of uh, uh, protected from the environment around you. And I never went to an old town. I never went to see anything. I never really interacted with, generally with people except the ones that were friends or were considered to be the same kind of level. So I'd lost out on learning about my own self and about my own roots. And uh, so I went to England and there too, this whole thing about ego was bolstered because an architect is supposed to have really an inflated ego, only then you can design something that will be out of this world. So that's what I came back with. And, and it was a bit of a shock when I came back to Pakistan after having spent about eight years in England and I came and I found that uh, uh, things were really different. Uh, everybody is not well off. There were people who had nothing. And, uh, and of course, one had known this. I mean, it's not that one was not aware, but it had never really interacted. And also this whole cultural gap was there because uh, my father being an, uh, having been trained as an Indian civil servant was very much, in, was very, very anglicized. So we were taught and you know, we knew about, you know, and then again, when I went to England, that only reinforced that particular thing. My mother was very conservative. So she, I did learn quite a lot from her about our own traditions, but really I'd never experienced the old towns. I never knew what our cultural roots were. So that was important to understand uh, myself and where I was coming from and what I had to do, what my, what my role was going to be as, as an architect even. So luckily my husband, who's now a writer, but had also he'd been to Oxford and he uh, wanted very much to also learn about, about cities as well. So we were able to go around uh, old towns and learn quite a lot. And he's a very good photographer, so he did photo photography and so on. So that I think helped me to understand what was there. And that's how Heritage Foundation came into being because we found there was not enough material available as to how things were. And we thought we should do a lot more research to try to understand ourselves. It was really like trying to learn about your own roots that motivated us to, to set up a Heritage Foundation of Pakistan. You've conserved several buildings and monuments. As we know, your approach is based on low cost, zero carbon, zero waste principles and conservation. But how did you deal with alternative economic models in that time? And which is your favorite conserved building and why? Well, uh, of course, I've had uh, in my life, I've been very lucky. I've had lots of opportunities to work on many different, uh, uh, in many different aspects, uh, which I think we need to do in Pakistan. So it's, as an architect, it's not only uh, monumental buildings, but as, I, as you rightly say, I've been able to work on heritage. I've been able to write books. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of uh, research. Uh, we did a lot of you know, proactive work for heritage by creating Caravan Karachi. Uh, I managed to sit on the streets of, uh, of, of Karachi and when we celebrated historic buildings, um, I was I had the privilege of uh, being uh, UNESCO's national advisor for the Lahore Fort where I was able to go stay there. And, you know, at night I could walk around the whole fort, basically. It was at my disposal because there was just nobody there. 
So, uh, uh, and then of course, when the earthquake happened in 2005, again, I went there not knowing what my role was going to be, but there too, a whole new world opened up for me. And that's where I learned so much from being with people, seeing how they built and how we could really try and do things or find ways by which we can help them. Because what we have to understand is that design is a very important factor. And that's what's wonderful about being an architect is that you are taught about design. You develop this heightened sensitivity about how design can transform lives. And, uh, and that's where your training as an architect comes in so useful. So everywhere I've been, I've tried to see that I design something using traditional materials, but doing it in a manner that will improve the lives of people. So it's not just a tangible object or something concrete that you or something that you build, but it's also something uh, which gives, for instance, women dignity. And that's very important in the work that I do, because uh, if we just design something and put up a building, well, it means nothing unless it relates to people's own lives and their own kind of cultural roots also. So I think architects have to be really very sensitive about their own traditions. And um, I think more and more, if uh, more architects get engaged with, uh, with working with heritage, with being with humanitarian work, doing humanitarian work, being with people who have nothing, then you learn to design um, uh, elements and, and, uh, and structures that uh, will not only be uh, affordable, will be sustainable, but also that they will relate to their own lives, to the people's lives. So that's why I believe in co-building and co-creation, that we do it together. So, and that's where uh, all these sustainable materials are so important because if the same structure, if you imagine is built in, in, in a cement block or, or burnt brick, then uh, you can never really have the beautiful decoration that, that uh, earth uh, structures allow you to do. And that's what whole um, Pakistan Chula is about. That's all, you know, all I'm doing in terms of earth building is all about. So it's all part of what I have been thinking and what I've been assimilating all from this country. And I have to tell you this, that my Barefoot Social Architecture Baza is a product of Pakistan. And whether it's my, my Pakistan Chula or anything else that I do, it, 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 the roots are here within this country. I have borrowed nothing from anywhere else except lime from, as I keep on saying, from Marcus Vitruvius, and of course, with Earth, I have, I'm a great believer of, uh, of Hassan Fatihi. So these are the influences that have led me to do what I'm doing today. Okay, uh, you have also dedicated mission not to use cement and steel in your buildings. In today's architecture, bamboo is the most preferable green material for its low carbon features. But how will you ensure that the architecture community will get bamboo in Pakistan? Well, uh, first of all, I have to tell you that uh, I think it was um, uh, Oliver Wainwright, this very famous uh, architectural critic who wrote about me in, in, in The Guardian. And he, the title was, I was star architect for 36 years. Now I'm atoning. Because I'm one architect who's in the 80s has used the most amount of concrete and steel in any one building, which is the Finance and Trade Center with 750,000 square feet area or even, uh, or, you know, Pakistan State Oil Building with something like 450 square feet of area. So a huge amount of, I've inflicted a lot of damage in my earlier life, as I keep on saying, when I was practicing as an architect. And now, of course, the three materials that I use are earth and lime and bamboo. And uh, I think basically now, and just to tell you what I've been trying to do in the last while, we've all been locked up. Uh, um, the uh, Ralpindi Islamabad chapter of Institute of Architects Pakistan and very dynamic, uh, uh, the chair, uh, Fawzi Asad Khan, and my old friend uh, uh, is like a son to me, really, uh, which is Murad Jamil, who's helped me in God knows countless ways ever since I was working in the earthquake area. And we all decided that, you know, there should be these lectures of mine. So six lectures were delivered. And it's all about barefoot social architecture and about sustainable materials and how we can really change the mindset of architects to now, you know, stop just building for the 1% who are supposedly have all the wealth. Uh, if you look at the studies of uh, Thomas Piketty, this uh, famous economist uh, from, from, uh, from France, and, and, uh, uh, and this is everywhere in the world, it's not only here. Another thing, of course, is that you must know that uh, uh, climate change is a, is, a, is a reality and that all of us have to see that we should not really be uh, doing things which are going to damage the planet because we are all suffering from that. 
And thirdly, we also know, and there are studies that have been done by UNEP and uh, so many other organizations, that in construction today, the whole construction industry is actually um, responsible for uh, the use of th approximately 40 to 50 percent of energy. And steel and cement are the most energy consumptive materials in their production. So why are we using these materials? Now, lime is a very good substitute for cement because cement was nowhere until the 19th century. It was only lime that was used, whether you look at the Roman aqueducts or you look at the pyramids or you look at the, uh, the Timurid forts and our own Mughal forts and so on. It's not cement, it is lime. So lime is really, it lasts for centuries. And with, uh, with the Portland cement that was created uh, because of the industrial revolution and that because of so much money being available, uh, it was obviously, it has taken over. I mean, all of us have been taught how to use cement, but nobody is taught how to use lime. So I think we need to look back and see because lime is a very benign material. It also absorbs uh, uh, you know, carbon from the air. So I think instead of cement, we can easily start using, using uh, lime. Similarly, burn brick is not good. I mean, if you, use, uh, if you put lime with, with even earth, it can make you a very strong brick. So why use uh, um, uh, you know, burn brick, which is again, it pollutes the environment. And there's also the whole thing about you know, child labor and all the rest of it. So architects should be now very careful what they do. And similarly, bamboo is an amazing material. And I have to say that I never really used it until about 2009, I think, when we were working in the, uh, in the camps in, in Mardan, uh, where something had to be done very quickly. And ever since then, I have not used a single scrap of wood. And I'm only using bamboo, and it's worked very well. A lot of people think bamboo does not last. So I give the example of uh, Kumamoto in Japan. They're very kind, as you probably know, they awarded me this uh, Fukuoka uh, prize. And so when I went there, uh, they were kind enough to take me and ask to see Kumamoto Castle because there'd been an earthquake. And we go there and I find, uh, going around the town and then the castle, I find that lots of, a lot of uh, plaster had come off. And inside, what do I see? I see a, a wonderfully made bamboo lattice, 400 year old uh, castle, right? And, and the whole town actually was about that old. So bamboo can be very resilient. It's there really, I'm using it. Uh, there's 40,000 or 43,000 units that we've built uh, of houses. Uh, I've used bamboo, uh, mostly in the roof, but also in the walls. And uh, uh, it's withstood. Uh, I've got a, actually a, a, a video that I show, which is on a shaking table test, how oh, with earth blocks or earth brick, if you use bamboo uh, in between as lattice and also on the roof, how it can actually go up to 670% of Kobe earthquake and not, not collapse. So there's a lot of value in this. And I think architects need to be now looking at this. And that's why the lectures were done. And I'm very pleased. I believe that uh, altogether there must have been about over 6,000 live audience with the lectures that I've given, uh, which was specifically for this particular purpose. Uh, and also in India and, and, and uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. So I'm just happy that people are looking at it. And uh, I think architects are, have now to really change the way that they work because it's a different, it's not the same time when I graduated, you know, in the 60s and 1960s. This is now the 21st century where the problems are far bigger, where sustainability issues are far more important. Climate change is a fact of life. And uh, we all know that we are taking too much from the, from the planet and we have to try to see how we conserve it. Okay, uh, how successful do you find yourself in spreading the local building techniques and materials among the Sindh Valley region in Pakistan? Well, I think uh, we, uh, when uh, we worked with IOM and luckily it happened because there was no money left and uh, donor fatigue had set in. And that's how they said, well, you know, let's see what Yasmin is doing. So luckily, uh, because of having no money or very little money, uh, I was able to really take the whole thing forward. And, in a sense that Pakistan is now really the lead, it's the uh, uh, in zero carbon shelter program. There's no other country that has done zero carbon as we have done. So that's the first thing. But of course, we also know that that's a drop in the ocean. So now with COVID-19 and with uh, uh, some um, uh, other material that has come up, like the BBC video about uh, the work that I'm doing, which had, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of hits, so we're getting a lot of interest in the whole thing. And with my lectures also, I think that's made a lot of difference as well. And so I've decided that if we want to leave, if I want to get to the poor and a lot of rich people who also want to make their, you know, their farmhouses and God knows what. 
So I have to tell them, well, look, I only work for the poor. I'm not really designing for the for the rich, so I can't really do that. But it uh, occurs to me or occurred to me that we need to really uh, teach everybody how to build these things. So we are now making these video tutorials, uh, there'll be about 17 or 18 of them, in which every step is going to be defined. So anybody can take it and they can follow it and they can build their own house now with mud and lime and, 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 uh, and bamboo. Okay, uh, what motivated you to work and explore humanitarian architecture and what was the reason to close your office in 2000? Uh, okay. <laughs> Interesting question, huh? Well, um, in 2000, again, I'm afraid all my stories are very long now because everything kind of happened in so many different ways. It just happened that my husband, who was running an insurance company, and uh, my father, having retired, he'd set up lots of companies and the family members were running each one. And uh, uh, when Mr. Bhutto had uh, announced nationalization, and they said 22 families in Pakistan had the most wealth. So uh, somehow uh, uh, this particular whole group of uh, what you call cyber uh, group of companies came under the radar. And so everything that uh, was of value had, was nationalized. So my husband who was running the insurance company, he lost a lot. And so he tried to run it for a few years and then he decided to close up, he retired. And he retired to write books because he's a good historian. And uh, so in uh, 2000, I thought, well, you know, if he's writing books, why am I struggling with my work, which was really mainly for the, for the rich, for corporate sector. And, you know, you've done a couple of them and it's the same thing you keep on doing. Uh, and so there's no fun left in, in doing the same thing again and again. You're pandering to, you know, people who think that they know better and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's not really all that interesting. And I... I uh, I felt that, you know, I, I was a little bit rigid. I, I would not do the things that they would want. And so I thought, well, the time has come for me to now also start writing books. So that's how I retired in the year 2000. But it wasn't long before, because I'd done some books on Karachi, that Caravan Karachi was uh, came into being in 2000, uh, because my book, uh, it's called The Guidebook on, uh, I think, Heritage Guidebook for Karachi. And so a lot of people turned up and said, we need to do something about the city of Karachi. That's how we began sitting on the streets. Uh, every Sunday, we were celebrating one heritage building or the other, um, uh, and so on, so on. So, so that was something. And yeah, so I, th I think I had uh, di many different exposures, many different things. And then they said I was at the Lahore Fort uh, for three years. And then, uh, of course, the earthquake happened, and I was there. And a lot of architects went at that time, like everybody else, but a lot of them had to come back because they were working, they had their offices. I was very lucky. I was not practicing, so I could stay on. So I just, and I, then there was just one disaster after another. So I just kept on, you know, working in it and trying to find solutions for each, each kind of problem. So that's why I'm still there. All right. So ma'am, what advice would you li like to give to the young architects who want to pursue humanitarian architecture? I think it's a huge and a wonderful field. And I think, you know, you can do a lot of things, but I think the, uh, uh, the experience you get in humanitarian field, you can never get anywhere else. These are life-changing experiences when you go and work in, a, in an area which has been hit by any kind of disaster. And nothing is more rewarding, I can tell you from my experience, than being able to help out in a place where people are desolate and they need help. And as I keep on saying to architects, because they are in such a good and such a, um, how shall I say, a fortunate position of knowing how to, um, how to coordinate, how to put a lot of things together and, and the design, they can design everything. So with the, uh, with the lowliest of materials and the, the, the smallest amount of money, you can create something really beautiful. And, uh, and if you work with tradition, then there's so many things that you can take on and you can improve them. And, and so I think the field is just wide open. There's so much, uh, everybody feels, you know, this is the big, I think, a uh, whole uh, mistake. Yes, ma'am. So uh, with architects, I'm always saying this, that, uh, you know, there are lots of consultants who come to our countries where there's been so many disasters and they make quite a lot of money out of disasters. And I don't see 
Pakistani experts in the field, especially hardly any architects. Obviously, there's money. That's why so many consultants from abroad turn up when, whenever we have a disaster, and we have so many of them. I was told the other day that instead of the seventh one, we are now in the fifth, the fifth most vulnerable country. So there should be many architects who should be getting involved in both humanitarian work as well as on, on heritage conservation work, because these are two very important works that are necessary for the country. And uh, uh, since we have this mistaken concept and you know that only if you work for the rich, architects can make money. Well, I think this is entirely untrue. All the people who work for me are paid. Architects that I, that I have uh, or that work for me are paid probably better than most other architecture firms. Uh, although I'm, my work is all pro bono uh, because I had the, I had the uh, organization. And uh, by this time, of course, in my life, I need to do pro bono work. So this is a different story. But uh, others who work, they are paid. And so I think there's enough money. Uh, now, for instance, reaching the sustainable development goals, there's a lot of money for South Asia and for, uh, and for uh, uh, you know, other sub-Saharan African countries and so on. So I think architects should really now start putting some attention to this because not everybody can be star architect, we must know. And uh, there are other fields and, you know, the training that you get as an architect equips you to do many things. And why aren't they doing other things also? There is no reason for just sticking to design offices. Uh, and why is it the design offices are not also doing something on the side of humanitarian work or on heritage work? This also I don't understand. Because unless we find ways now for young people or young architects to get engaged in this, uh, it's, it's going to be a losing battle for, for everybody. But I have to tell you this, that uh, as, an, as a result of my six lectures uh, in Pakistan, uh, organized by, uh, uh, as I said, architect for Zia Sat Khan and, and Murad Jamil, uh, we decided to actually, and, and IAP, of course, uh, Arif Tengezi, the president, that we will conduct a competition for architects on zero carbon structures. And the competition was held, and I'm very happy to tell you that it, the ju judging has been done for it, I'm told by the jury, and they've declared the prizes also. And uh, I, I think that was one step we wanted to take to see how we could support this kind of work. And I think the more and more this kind of uh, activity is taken up, I think the better it would be. What we have to now do is to see that the, that government and uh, uh, patrons uh, who actually commission architectural works also understand that everybody has to lower the carbon footprint that we cannot carry on in the way that we do. So they must also now join hands and then architects will be more inclined to design in that way. But I'm hoping that every architect will now start thinking how to lower the carbon footprint in whatever they're doing. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you for, uh, for, uh, from World Architecture Community once again. Thanks Thank for you, talking. Thank you for talking to us.